Good morning, friends. Today we are starting with the second letter of Peter, and I want us to focus our attention on the first half of this chapter. Let me start by reading verses two and three and set the stage for what follows next. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him, who has called us by His own glory and goodness. First off, let me uh, point some obvious things that jump out. Um, God's power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything. What we find in this reading is not only is He interested in our lives, He wants us to thrive on earth, and it's not you or I that somehow have to manufacture these things. We grow by God's power. Second, we find this word knowledge repeated twice in the first few verses, and we have to wonder what that's all about. At the time, in the first century, there were a bunch of teachers who emphasized a secret knowledge of God. And as we read through the rest of this letter, you will notice that this word knowledge appears a few more times. It helps us understand that Peter was placing his ideas in contrast with the ideas of these teachers. On one side, you have the Gnostics who were teaching that knowledge is hidden from believers. But Peter, on the other hand, is saying that knowledge isn't something that's hidden from believers, but in fact is found in a person, Jesus Christ. He's teaching that godly life is possible because of Jesus' power, because we know him intimately, not really something that's hidden from believers. And as we continue reading in verse 4, he says, Through these he has given us his great and precious promises, so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. I'm fascinated by the idea of being called to participate in the divine nature. Philosophers at the time were saying that godliness and goodness and sharing in the divine were um, really nice ideas, but in practice they're not possible. If you think about it, it's not so different from the philosophers of today. And Peter wants to say in the midst of those ideas that it is the one true God who imparts godliness and goodness to its believers. And, not, and because of these promises and the knowledge of his death and resurrection, we get this gift, the gift of being able to share in his divine nature. He starts out in verse 5 saying, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. When I read this initially, it, uh, it sounded like a contradiction. In the beginning of the chapter, he does say that his divine power has given us everything we need, like, like a gift. Now he says, make every effort. This sounds like a contradiction. Um, but philosophers have long argued about this part. You know, what is God's part of the transaction? What is our part of the transaction? And let me uh, try to make this simple. Peter is saying, look, if you have been granted this gift, please take care of this gift, a gift that we cannot manufacture. It is given by God. And because it is such a precious gift, we are asked to take care of it. And we are to take care of it by making every effort to add to our faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Notice we don't have these, but we are asked to add these qualities. In fact, he says, make every effort. Or in other translations, you may find the word diligent. I'm not sure about you, but I think I can say with all honesty, I don't make every effort or apply all diligence. But that is exactly what Peter is inviting us to. Participate in the divine nature by adding and practicing these qualities in our daily life. As we'll read in uh, chapter 2 tomorrow, he says things like, the more you grow like these, the more productive and useful you'll be in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next half of the letter talks about the importance of prophecy. And one thing that strikes me in this message in verse 16 is, it says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. In the midst of the different message preached by the Gnostics, Peter is saying that this message is reliable, does not have its origins in the prophet, but through, even though they are human, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
As I read this letter, it's clear to me that Peter wasn't messing around. In writing to these folks who had all kinds of influence from their culture, telling them a different message, he has clear instruction that God has given us everything we need for a godly life. And we are his ambassadors that, that those who represent the king ought to respond to God's promises, nurture that gift of faith and carry this message of Jesus and his kingdom because it is reliable and trustworthy.